Pastor Steve, for your ministry in my absence. I uh, really appreciate it. I was at home last week. I, I didn't travel, but I was at home, so I participated through the live stream. So to everyone at home, that was a lot of fun to be at home and experience that. Uh, whether you're in your pajamas or you've dressed up and you're going to church in your home, I'll be honest with you, I struggled a little bit in that environment. I wound up kind of like just having the TV going and I was making bacon while I was... Uh, participating in worship. So I just struggled. I kind of multitasked. But I do like the, uh, the, the engagement we're seeing, all those chats, and it was fun to be a part of that with you last week. And, and the engagement here uh, last week was our biggest attendance so far. And it looks like many of you have come back. So we welcome you. For those who have been giving financially online, please keep doing so. It's the most effective, efficient, safest way for us to give. If you do have a tithe or an offering, you want to give that, you'll be given opportunity as you are dismissed. And we sure hope you stop by and pick up some of those goods for your neighbors or friends. God has blessed us so we can be a blessing. That's the word given to Abram in Genesis. So speaking of God's word, would you open up your copy to Acts chapter 21 and we'll begin the reading in verse 27. But I do want to put a slide up first to introduce where we're going today because it's a little bit different over the last number of years I've been the pastor here, uh, there's been a lot of times where I felt in my heart to share certain messages, messages that I felt like as I listened to our congregation would really help us. Messages as I listened to the world around us, it would help us to be equipped to engage the world. But because of the tension and because of sometimes the timing, uh, I just need to wait on the Lord, be led of His Spirit to bring those words to you. And I have a sense from the Lord that I have a liberty right now to share this message on citizenship with you. You're going to see this graphic at home or here that depicts where we're going to go that this Sunday, the next Sunday, and the following Sunday, a three-part series on what it means to be a citizen, the biblical pathway to citizenship. First, we're born on earth. We are citizens of earth. John chapter 3 says we're born of water. That's our first birth. Then our second birth is we're born of the Spirit, and then we become citizens of heaven. Actually, in our first song today, we sang about being a citizen of heaven. So today we're going to talk about our citizenship on earth, what the Bible shows us about that in a story about Paul, the apostle, when he was arrested, and then the protection of law, because he was a citizen of Rome, kept him safe. Next week, we'll talk about what it means to be a citizen of heaven and how that directly informs our citizenship on earth. In other words, the two work together. We have dual citizenship. Some of you out there in our congregation have dual citizenship. You have a passport from the United States of America and a passport from another country. You have the rights and privileges and duties and obligations of both nations. And then the third week, God willing, we'll speak and talk about as a reminder that once we were all foreigners to God, once we were all strangers, we were all aliens, we were all out there, and God brought us in here to himself. And that we'll use that moment to consider those who are outside the citizenship of heaven. So today we want to first focus on who we are here on earth, and we'll look at this biblical story. Children, I'm sensitive to where you are in this. We're going to put some pictures up from a children's Bible for this first reading to help you engage. Children, I also know some of these things you're going to say, I don't, I don't even know what that's about. If you participate, kids, in this three weeks, you'll learn more about citizenship than I did in school. Sadly, citizenship was taught in our public schools years ago. It is no longer. And I think it's part of our struggle and our problem. I'm also sensitive that some of you are here and citizenship is a buzzword. It sounds political. Well, it's biblical. It sounds like, are you going to step on my toes? What if I'm not a citizen? No, I, I don't have any intention to step on your toes. I want to love you enough to speak the truth in that love about what the Bible says. But if I do step on toes, if I do say something that causes you harm or hurt, please give me grace. You can feel welcome to tell me that I've offended you so I can make amends and ask your forgiveness. But I ask you at the front end, already forgive me. That in my humanity, I'll do my best to explain the first century implications. And then God willing, on Tuesday, release a video to you. Ask the pastor about citizenship, where I will go into more detail and give some views as your pastor as to the pathway 
for citizenship. Those who are naturalized citizens, those who are in process to be naturalized citizens, and those who are born citizens. What does that look like and how can we answer some of those questions together? If you want to pose a question, you're welcome to do so. You can fill out a Connect card today before you leave, or at home you can email me, info at livingwordworcester.com. So with all that said, would you pause with me? Let's pray. We might hear and do the Word of God. Lord, we are aware of the gravity of this moment culturally, politically, socially, theologically. We are being stretched. But your word stands. Your word will remain. May your word come forward today and uniquely illuminate the path to citizenship. Open our understanding. Open our eyes. Open our hearts. And change us by the power of your spirit as we hear your word. Give us conviction and courage to do your word. We pray for your help in all of this, Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. That was the saddest amen I've ever heard. Maybe it's speaking to the somberness and the sincerity of this moment, which I do appreciate. Well, if you have a copy of God's word, you'll want to turn, if you haven't already, to Acts 21. And we'll begin in verse 27. Remember, this is the Apostle Paul, and he's going to be arrested at the temple. And we're going to explain that and lead the conversation biblically towards citizenship. From verse 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who's teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he'd done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, Away with him! We'll pause there. One of the ways to interpret and understand and help bring clarity from God's word is to ask questions. Some of you have been parts of our connect groups, particularly the precept Bible study. Know this methodology well. I'll ask a question and then I'll answer it. There's plenty of other questions to be asked and answered. Again, we'll leave many of those for our Tuesday Ask the Pastor and then Wednesday we'll do a midweek Bible study on the same passages. But for today, let's ask this question. Why were Jews from Asia stirring up a crowd and then ultimately the whole city? It says here in verse 27, when the seven days were almost complete, let's start there. What had happened before this is that the Apostle Paul, with a delegation that he had collected from different parts of the Greek world, including those from Asia. That means Asia Minor or modern-day Turkey. He had collected them as a delegation and brought an offering, a financial contribution to Jerusalem. He said he wanted to help the poor Christians in Jerusalem, and he wanted to pay tribute because it's through the Jewish people that Jesus came. And he wanted to bless the Jewish homeland with the Gentile or non-Jewish offerings. How awesome is that? All these new believers, all these people who received life with Jesus, he said, it's up to you now to honor those who gave this message to you. Let's bring them an offering. And the way you did that in that day was you didn't send a check, you didn't send a wire, you didn't go downtown and fill out a form. You had to travel with the money. And he took delegates along with so they could represent the different churches that gave the money and stand as one body and say, we love you. And they presented that gift to James 
the leader of the church and the elders. And James, this is the same James related to Jesus by blood. James was like, we are so happy. Would you tell us what's going on out there among the non-Jews? They gave report. They were so excited. But there was something of caution. James says, look, I got to tell you, there are now many, many, there's thousands of believers in Jesus among the Jewish people. But they've been hearing all kinds of stuff about you. They've been hearing that you're telling other Jews around the world, don't be circumcised, don't keep the law, don't listen to Moses. So here's what we're going to do. And he came up with a plan. We're going to show them that you're still serious about the Jewish faith. So I want you to take a vow of purification. And the way they would do that was they'd go to the temple and say, look, we, we want to make sure we're pure. And right before God, they'd pay some money. They'd shave their head so everyone would know they're under a vow. They'd set the date that the vow would be complete. He said, not only you do that, Paul, but take these other brothers with you. Then it will be a sign to all the Jews that you not only care about yourself, but them. And he did. Then we pick up here in verse 27. When the seven days were almost complete, he had made a vow that he was going to keep for seven days. And he was in the temple worshiping. Paul was being faithful. But some Jews from Asia saw that Trophimus was among the delegation traveling with Paul. And Trophimus was from Asia. And these Jews from Asia, principally from the city of Ephesus, saw this guy. And they, I know that guy. And I know he's not Jewish. I bet he's in the temple with Paul. And that's a violation of our rights. And they went after Paul. They didn't send him a letter. They didn't write to the elders and say, would you discipline Paul? They called for his head in the streets. They rushed with one voice and they were saying, with all the bias and prejudice, everything that they had from hearsay, hey, this guy violates our customs and our laws. They had no idea what Paul was saying to people when he traveled the Gentile world, but they heard what he said. Secondhand information is dangerous in the first century. I suspect you're going to find some correlations with our 21st century in this. They, like us, fall prey to presupposition, to supposing we know what's going on. Which leads us to the second question, why did the crowd cry out? Join our cause. Well, not only was their assumption that Trophimus was in the temple, but Let's be honest, if we really read and understand the Jewish-Gentile tension, the Jewish people that time, even though they believed in Jesus, were still holding to old customs, old traditions, old ways of thinking. And they weren't really comfortable with new people coming to church. Or, I'm sorry, the temple. They weren't really comfortable with new people coming into their faith because for generation after generation after generation, they were told they were a special people, a chosen people, a holy people, and they are and were. But it was God's good plan to bring Jesus through the Jewish people to become the savior of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And somehow the Jewish people started to lose sight of that or maybe never reckoned with that. And they were upset that this temple area was now going to be infiltrated by people that they were uncomfortable with or didn't like. Or maybe they felt even superior. Maybe they felt better then. I'm not all sure. But what I know is they were able to go out into the street and there were enough people that believed their view of life that joined them and ran to this protest. So how then, question three, did the whole city get stirred up? How'd they start running? We don't get all the specifics, but what we get is they were crying out. You got to come see this. This guy's trying to destroy our whole way of life. Everything is wrong right now. Come and help us make it right. Question four, what was Paul arrested for and why was he arrested and then questioned? Well, it turns out that this whole commotion caught the ear of the lookouts on the sentry tower of the fortress of Anatolia. That's a special area just on the part of the, of the fortress of the temple which Herod the Great had built. And the Roman garrison was there and they had sentries and they're looking down like, oh boy, this is trouble. They run to the tribune, equivalent of a colonel, commander of a thousand men. And said, so we got to get down there. There's a violent mob going on. And they rush down there and they see Paul getting beaten to a pulp. And they intervene and bind him with chains. 
Then they stop and ask, hey, um, what did this guy do? And some people are shouting one thing, some people are shouting another. I'm not sure why he was arrested first, but one thing is for sure, it was for his own safety. That somehow the law enforcement of the first century was still about protecting people from being lynched by the mob. Now the Tribune asked for these facts. Who knows what's going on here? And no one had the facts. What role do facts play? Well, they're pretty important, it turns out. Question five, what role do facts play to the Tribune? So important that he says, you know what? We're going to pause everything. We're going to get him out of here. Bring him back to the barracks. We'll question him there. I can't make heads or tails of what this audience is saying. And then lastly, why did the soldiers protect Paul? By carrying him through the mob. Because on the surface, it looked like the mob wanted justice for worship. They wanted to uphold the right and just way for Jews to worship. But behind that, they were crying out, away with him! And they were beating him physically. What's that suggest? Well, we don't even have to surmise it. Acts 23 will tell us explicitly, once this mob could not kill him, a group got together and made a plot. I will not eat or drink until Paul's dead. Over 40 men. And they actually went to the chief priest and the elders and were sanctioned for their vendetta. We are now going to release you to go kill Paul. What I'm suggesting to you is that in this first century, this mob, and that's what the Bible uses that word, this riot, this violence on the surface looked like it was for right worship, but underneath it, they simply wanted to destroy a man's life and kill him. Let me pause there and say, I'm so happy Paul didn't die. Because I wouldn't have all these books of the Bible to read if he was dead. I'm so happy that God in his grace did something through government to protect Paul and spread the gospel so that a person like me and you can hear the good news of Jesus Christ. There's much more to say and we'll do so on Tuesday and on Wednesday in the follow-up material. So let's read on and find out what more we can glean from this first century encounter. Let's pick it up in verse 37. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins into the wilderness? Paul replied, I'm a Jew. From Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city, I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people, and there was a great hush. And he addressed them in the Hebrew language. This is really profound, because what's about to take place, and I'll cover this in the midweek Bible study, is that the Apostle Paul is going to give his personal testimony of conversion He's going to tell everyone who was just trying to kill him how Jesus found him while he was also a killer. While one time in history, Paul was trying to kill people who were Christians. He's going to say, I was on that road to go arrest some people, but Jesus met me on the road. We just sang out of that grave. Out of that grave. And Paul's going to testify that he was once dead in his sins, but Jesus met him on the road with such marvelous light, and he is now saved, born again of the Spirit, now a citizen <clears throat> excuse me, of heaven. But he first is going to make appeal to his citizenship on earth. Listen to what's going on. He says to the uh, tribune, hey, tribune, can I say something to you? And the guy's like, whoa, 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 what are you doing speaking Greek? I, I, I thought you were the Egyptian. Doesn't this often happen in life? And certainly in law enforcement, there's a case of mistaken identity. You look like so-and-so. Maybe there was some profiling going on. You look like, aren't you that Egyptian? No, 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 no. I'm a Jew. You got the nationality all wrong, first of all. And not only do I speak Greek, but I'm about to address the people in their own dialect, Aramaic. But he appeals diplomatically. He finds a way to persuade the tribune by using language, not only the Greek language, not only the Aramaic, but say, you know what? I want you to know who I am. I'm a Jew, and I'm from the city of Tarsus. 
a citizen of no obscure city. He appeals to his citizenship to, to let this guy know he's somebody from somewhere, and so are you. He's somebody from somewhere, and he verifies his identity as we go through this story. But what that immediately told the tribune was, whoa, you're from Tarsus. Everyone knows Tarsus. That's a great city. That's a fantastic city. It's a city of well-educated people. And if he's a citizen, it meant he was a landowner, which meant he had a certain degree of wealth. He thought, wait a minute, I, I might not be dealing with the same guy that this mob thinks, so I'm just going to let him, let's hear him out. I want to get the facts straight. Let's let him speak it out. Of course, then he surprises everyone by speaking Aramaic. And the whole crowd gets hush. Let's read on. We'll save the testimonial of the Apostle Paul for our midweek Bible study, but let's pick it up in verse 21 of Acts 22. This is at the end of his testimonial. Everyone's buying into what he's saying. Everyone's tracking with him. In Acts 22, verse 21, Jesus is going to be speaking to Saul. And here's what Jesus said to him. Excuse me, Paul. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Verse 22. Up till this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air. The tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they'd stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man's a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, Yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum of money. Paul said, But I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. What is going on here? How does all this relate? What does this mean for you and me? We're going to talk more about that later this week, but let's talk about the first century. What we're hearing from God's word up until this point is that law and order matters. The laws of the land had to be enforced. And the Roman tribute and the soldiers played that part. If not, all that crowd would have not heard about Jesus and Paul would have died and no one else in the Gentile world, maybe your ancestors and mine, would have heard about Jesus. We also hear that identity matters. Who you are, where you're from, your story, your voice matters. And Paul was able to use his own voice to tell his own story. It's so important. Thirdly, facts matter. The law enforcement can only operate when it's dealing with the reality of facts, not hearsay. Language matters, fourthly. Paul uses diplomacy. He uses seasoned language, persuasion to work influence, and citizenship matters. Paul appeals first to his citizenship of Tarsus, then later his Roman citizenship. He tells us his nationality, he's Jewish, but he tells us about his citizenship. Citizenship has to do with your rights. Wikipedia, which is an open source material, which is only why I use it for this case, defines citizenship this way. A citizen is a member of a sovereign group of people that have certain rights. Let me give an illustration, and some of you will know this well because You've been through the naturalization process of the United States. The first 10 amendments to the Constitution are known as the Bill of Rights. Amendment one, this is your right if you're an American citizen. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. 
You, as a citizen of the United States, have rights. The same was true for the Apostle Paul. He had rights as a Roman citizen. We have to know our rights, is what the Bible is telling us through Paul's life. He knew his rights. So he knew when his rights were being violated. He understood that his rights were being violated, that he was being mistreated, and he called these law enforcement officers to account. Let me also suggest there's some new information in this last reading. He's asked, are you a Roman citizen? Oh, yes. And then the tribune says, well, I, I bought that with a large sum of money. And then Paul says, yeah, but I was born a citizen. It's almost to speak of, and several commentators have remarked to this, F.F. F. Bruce included, John Stott included, that there could be a sense of corruption and bribery which the tribune is reading, uh, referring to in a story. In other words, to say, look, I, I put my name on the list to become a citizen of Rome, but I couldn't, get, I couldn't get that name moving. So you know what? I had to use a large sum of money. I had to pay off this clerk, pay off this administrator, had to pay off this officer, had to sweep this judge up, had to get everything moving in the right direction, and that's how I became a citizen. Maybe to even say, you know, look, I, I, I earned my way there. I mean, I know who I am. I just want to make sure you know who you are. And then he says, but I was born a citizen, which meant his father was a citizen. Now, here in the United States, whether you're a naturalized citizen or naturally born a citizen, you have the same rights. And some of you have moved to this country for exactly that reason. Some of you have moved to this country and, it's, and you're on that pathway to citizenship. Maybe in the shadows, maybe in the light, maybe you're trying to work your way. And here we're getting a situation where we're confronted with the possibility of large sums of money. We need a good, clean, clear pathway to citizenship. The Bible does not call any of us to corruption and malfeasance. It's against the law. But we need a path. And I'll speak to that later this week. And this is why it's so important that we understand that whether you're on your path to citizenship on earth, and I'll speak now to those here in the United States, or you already are, we do believe in the rule of law. If you were a naturalized citizen, in other words, if you moved here from another country, filed your paperwork, and you stood, you took an oath. Now, those of us born here didn't take that oath. We were taught the Pledge of Allegiance. We were taught to stand when the national anthem is sung. We were taught things to honor that allegiance. But if you came here and became a citizen, you had to vocalize it. Listen to the words that are required. I hereby declare an oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen, that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. The Apostle Paul is reminding us, God's Word is reminding us, the book of Acts is reminding us that when you are a citizen, you have rights. And those rights need to be known by you. And I'm asking you, children at home, parents at home, everyone here, if you're a citizen of the United States, read the Bill of Rights today. Read and understand what that says about who you are because it's about your freedom as an individual to express your worship to God and your peaceful demonstration it's about assembling together what we're doing now. And what we're saying is if you're a citizen, then you can live not only in that privilege and that right, but in all the other duties that come. We'll talk more about that later this week. So let me summarize now as we prepare to close. If we've understood what we've heard, we can say it this way. Even though this tribune may have been corrupt, we don't know, but that's implied. He also saw himself as under the law. This is why he was so afraid. Let me read the last verse again. So those who went to examine him withdrew from him immediately, meaning they stopped the torture. 
And the tribune was also afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. See, he had bound Paul with chains unlawfully. And now the Roman tribune is shaking in his, his sandals, saying, I might go to jail. I might be punished because I did something against the law. Law enforcement is guided by the law. And law enforcers must also obey the law. That's what the Bible indicates. So we can summarize then saying, God is using Roman citizenship, the Roman citizenship of Paul, to help proclaim the gospel by protecting Paul and holding law enforcement in balance and check. We can also say God is using the Roman laws to advance the gospel, the freedom of speech that Paul had. He's freely proclaiming Jesus all around the Roman world. You see, government comes from God. Romans chapter 3 tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which means your governors, your government will be of fallen, sinful people. God also calls you and I who are Christ followers, Christians, to engage the world as salt and light. I'm praying that 10 years from now, we'll be laying our hands on Congress people, senators, judges, officials, those on school committees, and sending you out as missionaries to be salt and light, to represent Jesus Christ. Your citizenship matters. We've heard that from this text. We should be wary of the mob. It often has an agenda with another agenda. And we should be reminded that law enforcement is necessary and not perfect. And needs to be held to the same standard of every citizen. And there's one who holds the high standard. The person who follows Jesus. God willing, next week we'll discuss our role as Christians in setting the example, the heavenly example, on earth. But today we need to turn to Jesus. I'm inviting our worship team to come. I'm inviting you to prepare yourself for communion. Worship team will sing this song first before we receive the cup and the bread. But let me read the scripture which illuminates for us the person of Jesus as the great governor, as the great king. So that when you and I finish reading this text, we can together pray for the United States of America where we find ourselves now on this soil. We can pray that God will move on our land. We can pray that God will mobilize citizens to do the hard work of citizenry, the accountable work, the clear conscience that it will take for us to be honest with the facts, not hearsay. And we will appeal to the great governor, to Jesus the Christ. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. A scripture often read at Christmas, but could not be more appropriate than reading it now in August. Isaiah 9 verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Peace. Excuse me, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice, with righteousness, From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this.